Welcome to the Assembling Inclusion podcast. On this show, we feature different programs, individuals, and initiatives focused on being more inclusive of individual needs. We invite you to learn right alongside us. If you want some additional resources or access to our courses, please visit our website or follow us on social media. But for right now, let's get right to the episode. Coming up next on the Assembly Inclusion Podcast. Once you get someone in a wheelchair, they immediately have a new understanding and appreciation for how different it is. Just to do day-to-day tasks or to open a door or whatever it may be to carry something. You get young kids in a wheelchair and all of a sudden like their brain just starts going and you just hear some positive feedback. Now they're thinking about life from the perspective of someone who actually lives that life every day. In the final episode for our season, I interviewed Tyler McGregor from All Sports, All People, an organization that centers around inclusive sports in Canada. We talked to all about their school programming, which helps bring awareness to adaptive sports and inclusivity, their partnerships with different communities and organizations, and how their work is helping to bring adaptive and accessible sports to all athletes. So let's take a listen. Hello, and welcome back to the Assembly Inclusion Podcast. Today, I'm here with Tyler McGregor, who is from All Sports, All People, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So Tyler, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Just to start off, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about your background? For sure. So I grew up in southwestern Ontario in Canada. My hometown's Forest, and I actually grew up an able-bodied athlete. And so like a lot of young Canadian kids, hockey was my passion. And so, as I mentioned, I grew up an able-bodied athlete. Then at 15, I broke my leg, which a few months later led to a cancer diagnosis and the eventual amputation of my left leg above the knee. So that was back in 2010. And at that time, I was an aspiring athlete, a high performance athlete, and sports were a huge part of my life, in particular hockey. And so once I regained my health, I knew I wanted to continue to play and participate in sport. And so I I was looking for opportunities to do so. And as I mentioned, I grew up in a small town in southwestern Ontario. So there was a few opportunities close by, but you know, it was about an hour drive to be able to to transition from able-bodied hockey to para hockey. At that time, it was called sledge hockey, but I started in 2011 and was very fortunate to transition pretty quickly. I've now been playing on the national team for for 10 years, which is hard to believe, and been able to represent Canada now at three Paralympic Games. And kind of through that process is how I I got involved with All Sports, All People. Wade Beebe, our founder and director, is the one who started this organization and really had a passion for it. And I've been able to be involved now for almost six years. And it's something that that has been outstanding to be able to bring to communities and young families and young kids with varying disabilities, both physical, cognitive, whatever it may be. I didn't realize you've been playing at the national level for 10 years. That's a really long time. That's that's pretty amazing that you made the transition that quickly too. So that's really great. So can you tell us a little bit about, you talked to us, you started telling us a little bit about all sports, all people, but can you explain like what the initiative is supposed to be and what the inspiration was and how the program kind of got started? Well, All Sports, All People is an organization who we offer inclusive and accessible sports programs, primarily through para hockey and wheelchair basketball. But we've also done sports such as adaptive hand cycling, inner tube water polo. We're looking to include sports such as wheelchair tennis, wheelchair lacrosse. Our mission is to try and create inclusive and accessible opportunities within communities that we operate in so that that young kids and their families have the opportunity to participate in sport. And All Sports All People started through our founder, Wade Beebe. His son has both cerebral palsy and autism. And he was essentially denied the opportunity to participate in his schools across countries. You know, it was his passion that kind of drove this to begin because he wanted his son to have the same opportunities 
to participate in sport and to be involved in a team and to see all the benefits that, that sport can bring to our lives, both from a, a physical and a cognitive and a social development standpoint. And so he started this organization in 2014. And we started in Simcoe County, which is just north of the Toronto area, and since have expanded into the GTA. And since 2014, we've probably impacted, we'll say between five to 10,000 youth. Obviously, that was heavily impacted by the pandemic, but we're at this point now starting to kind of reach our pre-pandemic levels of community involvement, which is which is excellent. But long story short, we're an organization that helps work with different communities and their rec departments to create opportunities for young kids with disabilities or living with difficult circumstances to participate in sports so that everybody can be included. That's a lot of people. You said 5,000 or so people, even with the pandemic, that's a lot of people who were impacted by this program so far. The amazing thing is that as time goes on, we're obviously starting to partner with more and more communities. But the special thing is that we're seeing a lot of the same youth, a lot of the same families and watching them grow and develop and really start to mature and start to build confidence in themselves. So I think that's been one of the most incredible things is just over time to see that evolution has been pretty incredible. I'm sure that's got to be amazing progress to see from the beginning. And then as people grow in progress over time, I'm sure that's amazing to watch. You had said you partner with different communities. So would a community like a rec department in a specific town, like reach out to the organization and then you would come in and then work with them. So how does that typically work? It could go both ways, whether that's through us reaching out to them or them reaching out to us. It happens both ways, you know, especially now we're starting to see more of an emphasis on diversity and inclusion within rec departments across the country, which is extremely positive. So we are starting to be approached more and more to help kind of initiate and facilitate these inclusive programs, which is very exciting, but it typically starts that way. And one of the best things I think about our organization is that we offer the services of coming in to teach or coach these programs. We also have the equipment available to help make them possible. Essentially for families, in some cases, there is no cost. And in other cases, there is some just based on insurance. So it's quite low cost. So they're extremely accessible programs, but it's more so just working with the rec departments to schedule the ice time and, and honestly just working with them to, to kind of help promote and place emphasis on the importance of these programs. The accessibility piece is huge. The fact that it's either a very low cost or no cost to families, that's great to be able to get that out there and have these children or youth experience the sports without having to worry about like having a financial burden on top of it. That's really great. Absolutely. So, and I'm coming from an educational background. So actually how I found your organization was you had a school outreach program at one point, right? We were working with schools specifically. Can you talk to me about that? (laughs) It's something that now, I guess we're not totally past the pandemic, but we are able to at least this coming school year, reintroduce our school outreach program. And it's a way that we're actually able to reach a larger audience. It's kind of evolved as time has gone on, but pre-pandemic, a typical school outreach program would involve myself or a colleague going into a school, whether that's with a bunch of sleds to do a day of sledge hockey or wheelchair basketball. And we would typically take the first part of the day to provide education on diversity and inclusion and its importance within the school or using sport kind of as a venue to educate young people on its importance. And then from there, we would introduce them to what an inclusive sport looks like and offer them a different perspective to play wheelchair basketball, a sport that they probably have never played. Many of them would have played basketball, but it's a hands-on example, educational tool to teach people to look life through a different lens and to have a new appreciation and understanding. And ultimately through that, hopefully teach them to be more inclusive in their lives. We've had so much success with the school outreach program. And I think that's one thing that we've really missed over the past couple of years is having the opportunity to do that. Because I think it's so essential especially for young people, whether that's through the elementary school system 
or high school to learn at a young age about diversity and inclusion? I think that was one of the things that really stood out to me. I was thinking this is something that would have been so great for my students to experience. Even just to think about how can you be more inclusive and thinking about how to adapt things to make sure that everyone is included in whether it's sport or just in life in general. Mm -hmm. So can you think of an example of for how the program, whether it's the community-based program or the school outreach program has really had a positive impact? And you've seen that like... I'm trying to think of a specific example, but I just think once you get someone in a wheelchair, they immediately have a new understanding and appreciation for how different it is just to do day-to-day tasks or to open a door or whatever it may be to carry something. You get young kids in a wheelchair and all of a sudden like their brain just starts going and you just hear some positive feedback. Now they're thinking about life from the perspective of someone who actually lives that life every day and so I just think like the more you can educate people on that then the more open and accepting and the more thought they bring to their day-to-day life I could see how that would happen Mm -hmm. so you had mentioned before about with the community-based program the fact that it's low cost or there's no cost I had saw on your website that there's also a lending library for like the adaptive sporting equipment. So how does, how does that typically work? Cause I'm imagining that has to be pretty impactful. Like somebody who wants to participate in that type of sport, but may not have access to the equipment gets to like try it out now and gets to see what it's like. But I wanted to know a little bit more about that. Our lending library actually started as a result of the pandemic when in Canada, like we were kind of denied access or at least the general public was kind of denied access to public facilities for a good portion of time and so we had all this equipment available in storage that we weren't using and we wanted our community to remain active and and be able to participate in sport and so that idea kind of sparked as a result of the pandemic and so we just opened it up to our community that to reach out if you're interested in in using any piece of our equipment we have quite an extensive library of sleds and sticks of wheelchairs of hand bikes And so we opened that up to the general public and said, hey, if you want to continue to remain active and participate in adaptive or inclusive sport, then we're here to help and just reach out and we'll arrange an opportunity for for us to get you the piece of equipment or for you to come pick it up, whatever it may be. And so that's kind of something that's continued on. We currently have a few of our hand cycles that are loaned out to different members of our community. And, you know, if they're not being used, then we might as well get use out of someone to kind of prevent them from having to burden the cost of that piece of equipment. I know hand cycles certainly aren't cheap, neither are wheelchairs and neither are sleds. And so from our perspective, that's an opportunity for us to step in and and eliminate that cost and make sport more accessible. That's really awesome. I could definitely see how that would be benefiting to a lot of people. Even just like, I always think about, I have like a technology background. So I'm always thinking about like assistive technology and like, it's so expensive to buy adaptive equipment and things like that. So the fact that you're allowing people to use it and Mm -hmm. participate in sport, that's really fantastic. It's great. And it's been quite a popular uh, program since we initially launched it. So we're excited that we're able to continue to do that because What we're finding actually is as we continue to build relationships with different rec departments is that they're actually eventually going out and purchasing their own sleds so that they have them. Long term, our goal or our hope is that each rec department has sleds or wheelchairs of their own. And so we will always have our equipment library to fall back on if a certain community doesn't. But one benefit that we're seeing is that Many communities eventually are going out and purchasing their own, which creates more access and more opportunity down the line. But it means that we'll always have equipment to lend out. So it shows that the communities are really embracing this idea of inclusion and making sure that they have the equipment that they need so that the athletes in their community can participate. Yeah. So in your experience, you've mentioned a couple different ways that the program has been beneficial, but... How do you think that all sports, all people has helped increase the inclusion, well, inclusion in sports or inclusion for athletes? 
there's several examples and the school outreach program would be uh, probably first and foremost. And we found that we are continuously going back to the same schools and they're having such a tremendous time with inclusive sport. And so that's certainly one example. But then another great example is just the registration within our programs, within communities. It's no longer just a young family or a young boy or girl with with a physical or cognitive disability. We're starting to see able-bodied people register as well. And that's kind of the how the programs continue to grow. And so I think that is a perfect example of inclusion because these programs were created to create opportunities for people with disabilities, but inclusion is all about making sure that everyone is included, regardless of disability, financial challenges, race, gender, whatever it may be. We want everybody to be able to participate. And so whether you're a boy or girl, whether you're able-bodied, disabled, we're starting to see everyone register. And I think that's ultimately what an inclusive program is supposed to be. And I think that's a perfect example of how these programs have helped within communities. That's really impressive to see. Like you said, that's the whole goal is that everybody's playing together regardless. So that's great that there's such a variety in the amount of people who are registering for the programs. What are some of the future plans that you have for all sports, all people? Is there any like initiatives or any expansion ideas that you have now? We do. We're actually, as I mentioned earlier, we are starting to kind of reach our pre-pandemic levels and reestablish those partnerships and get them underway. It has been kind of a tedious process just with so much staffing issues and staff turnover within different communities. It took us a little bit longer than expected, but coming into the fall, we have plenty of program opportunities available. And even within that, there's relationships that we've established that will offer newly introduced programs with or in and around the GTA. And so I think our at this point, our plans for growth involve just integrating more within the GTA. That's taken a little bit longer than, than we would have liked or hoped for, but it's just about establishing kind of a relationship with each community so that no matter where you live, there's, there's no, I guess, geographical barrier to participate in one of these programs. So that's kind of short to long-term plans for growth. And we're very hopeful that that happens, but we would ultimately like long-term would love to bring this countrywide and have this type of organization operational across the country so that there really is no barriers to participate for anyone. That would be great that anybody has something in their community that they could go to without worrying about having to travel for that specific type of programming. Um, Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to either like a school looking to make their teams more inclusive or a rec department looking to make their programming more inclusive? What advice or recommendations would you give to them? There's so much value just in conversation and open dialogue in terms of inclusion with people who are living that lifestyle, like someone living in a wheelchair or an amputee like myself or someone living with a physical or a cognitive disability, whatever it may be. I think there's so much value in having those conversations and having that open dialogue and sometimes they can be uncomfortable. And I think I mentioned it earlier, but one of the things I would tell a school looking to be more inclusive is just to, as best you can, try and educate and to put yourself in that position. So one of the coolest examples that I've heard recently was a young girls hockey team out in Lloydminster, Alberta. They were advocating to make the new arena being built in their community more accessible and more inclusive to everyone. And so what they did actually was just, they went around their current arena and they got in wheelchairs and just experienced the barriers that they saw and felt uh, as they tried to navigate through the arena in a wheelchair. And I just thought that was so incredible and so educational for a young girls team. They were 11, 12 years old. But I just think that's kind of a perfect example of how you can teach young people about inclusion. 
that's really amazing that they had that in their mindset of I'm going to take an opportunity to figure out how I can make this more inclusive for other people. Mm -hmm. That is the ultimate goal. So that's really great that even at that age, they were able yeah. to. So impressive. Yeah. That. Yeah. It's really impressive. Definitely. Well, I just want to thank you so much, Tyler, for being here with us today and for sharing all about all sports, all people with us and sharing all about your experiences. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It's been great. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Assembly Inclusion Podcast. I hope the information in this episode taught you something new, gave you a new idea, or showcased a new perspective. If you liked the episode, feel free to leave us a review or a comment. If you have a recommendation for an individual or an organization who would make a great guest, you can message us on Twitter or Instagram or send us an email at assemblinginclusion at gmail.com. See you next time.